All right. Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. Let me look in the camera. Welcome everyone joining us online or at any of our locations, Northwest, Cal State, Outdoor Courtyard. What do you say, you guys? Let's welcome everybody joining us from all over. Come on. We're in part three of this series called The Names of God, and I hope you've come ready to learn, ready to, to grow. This is such an important, I think, series for your faith, for your walk, because a lot of us know maybe, we know, we know God, and maybe you even know the, the title God. You may know God in that sense, but that name in and of itself, after some time, even for a lot of you, can become very abstract, very impersonal God. When God is anything but, he wants to be a very personal present, revelatory, meaning revealing himself to you, kind of God. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 6 says, I will reveal my name to my people, and they will come to know its power, that there is power in the name of God. And all throughout the scriptures, it actually talks about God's names, the power of his name, and his various names. And they're not just like, uh, I don't know, they're not just titles. They, they reveal who he is and how we can relate to him and how we can trust him. In fact, Psalm 9 and 10 says, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. So the challenge is, I think for some of us, we don't know the name of God other than just God. It's very abstract. So it's hard for us to put our trust in, yet there is so much power in the personal names of God. So in this series, what we're doing, and this is going to take us all the way up to Christmas, we're taking these Jehovah names of God, because Jehovah is his relational personal name of how he wants to reveal himself to us. And we're sharing like what the Bible says about those names and how we can relate to God based upon those names. Last week, if you miss it, actually two weeks, go catch it. But last week we talked about Jehovah Saba or Yahweh Saba, Jehovah Saba. Um, he is the Lord of heaven's armies. And a lot of us don't realize, maybe relate to God in that way, that he is actually this warrior general commanding legions of angelic armies and it would probably um, help you if you actually understood and related to God like this because you'd fight your battles differently knowing that heaven's armies are fighting with you, okay? So that's the power of knowing his name. Today, here's the name that many people know. We just sang about it, probably with one of the most celebrated names of God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, Jehovah Jireh. So Jesus taught us in the New Testament, he said, when you pray, you know, pray, give us this day our daily bread. Well, in, in, for many years, generations ago, bread was a staple of a, you know, a, a common food. It was like the daily food, and it represents more than food. Daily bread would represent your, you know, your finances, it would represent your food, it would represent your health, it would represent the roof over your head. So Jesus says, I want you to pray for your daily provision from God, not your monthly, not your yearly. He wants you to know that your provision comes from God. See, what will, what will happen here though, the Lord will sometimes allow things to happen in your life to remind us that we need him every day. Like every day, I, 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 I need breath. I need provision. I need God. And you may be going through something in your life right now or a season of your life that is very challenging where it's kind of going through like you're like like you're going through difficult circumstances in your health or your finances or you're dealing with something you never thought that you would have to face or deal with and the god you need to know in this season and maybe the very reason why you're coming up against the challenge or against the lack or against the crisis is because god wants to reveal himself to you as jehovah jireh the lord our provider. Philippians chapter 4, 19 says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So sometimes he'll allow some things in our life to remind us that he is the one who provides. He provides for us actually everything we have in life comes from him. James 1, 17 tells us whatever is good and whatever is perfect is actually a gift that came from us from God our Father. Everything in our life, everything good, comes from him. So the principle of Jehovah Jireh, that God is our provider, is seen all throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament. But the name Jehovah Jireh comes from a particular story and instance in the Bible. And it's that one, that story that I want us to learn today, because I believe God wants to reveal himself to you as Jehovah Jireh. And maybe, maybe he has not been revealed, at least that, to, to the extent that he wants to be revealed in your life, for some reasons we're going to find out 
in this story. It actually shows up in the book of Genesis in Abraham's life. But let me kind of give you some context to the stage of Abraham's life that we're in. Um, We're going to be reading Genesis chapter 22, but way back in Genesis chapter 12, God gives the promise to Abraham of a seed, of a, actually it was the promise of the land, the promise of lineage that through his seed would come the Lord. It was land, lineage, and Lord. It was actually called, theologians call it the Abrahamic covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham that the land would be his and his descendants, the lineage, and the Lord would come through his his seed, the land, the lineage, and the Lord in Genesis chapter 12. Well, in Genesis chapter 16, many years had passed. He's over 100 years old. And him and Sarah are like, well, let's just take things in our own hands because it's not happening in our timeline. It's not happening. Maybe it's never going to happen. They begin to doubt the promise of God. And so they said, you know, here's the plan. Let's take our Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. She's going to be a surrogate, and she's going to conceive a child through us. And thus, Ishmael was born. Years later, Isaac would be born caveat, side note here. Um, I'm going to try not to take too much of a rabbit trail on this, but this is actually what we're seeing still in uh, Israel and Gaza today is what shows up in this biblical story in Genesis chapters 12 all the way through 26, you guys. It is the battle between the two sons of Abraham, Ishmael, who was the son that they had because of doubt and disbelief, taking matters into their own hands And Isaac, the son of the promise of God and the covenant, okay? And and you'll go, you can go read it in the in in this uh, in this account in Genesis chapter 21. Actually, what happened was was they they tried to do it their way, and God says, That's not it. That's not it. You guys, you guys stepped out of my plan. Genesis chapter 21, Isaac is born. Now, Isaac, when he's about two, anywhere from two to four years old, Ishmael is anywhere from like 16 to 19 years old. You can go read this account yourself in Genesis chapter 21. The Bible says Ishmael was a violent, wild donkey of a man, okay? And, and his descendants would be wild, violent people, okay? And, and, and he started um, abusing Isaac, a, a, a grown man abusing a two to four year old. And so Sarah says, this guy needs to get out. This, he needs to go. This, he's not the son of the promise. He made a mistake. Just go. And God says, I'll bless him anyway. Take, I'll take care of him. And, and, but Isaac is the one. So here's the battle has been going on since the very beginning. Ishmael's descendants are actually all Palestinians, Arabs, Iranians. That's all Ishmael. Isaac's descendants are Hebrews, the Jews. And it's been a battle. Since it's not new. What's happening in Gaza and Israel is, is not new right now. In fact, in, I'm taking a rabbit trail now, you guys. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Real quick. Okay, so around, it was like 600 years after the, the death of Jesus, Muhammad, uh, 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 the prophet Muhammad, so-called prophet Muhammad, uh, comes on the scene and he gets a visitation from an angel, which was not an angel. It was a demon that visited him. Because this demon gives him a gospel that is other than, Galatians tells us anyone who gives any or preaches any other gospel than this gospel is a demon, okay? So this demon visits Muhammad and says, no, they have it wrong. They, and they, Muhammad rewrites the whole narrative of the Genesis story. And he says, no, the angel told me that Ishmael was the son of the promise. He was the one that was the blessing. He's the one that was the one to sacrifice himself for Abraham. And Isaac was the one that was cast out. And they rewrite the whole narrative to paint the picture as Isaac was the one who's despised and rejected and it does not, is not supposed to have the land, the lineage, or the Lord. It's actually Ishmael. Okay, so this battle has been going on from the very Beginning, Genesis chapter 21, God allows Sarah to get pregnant. They have Isaac. All that to say, and this is all precluding to the message. Okay, when we try to rush the promises of God, when we try to take control of the promises of God and put it in our own hands, when God promised an Isaac, you'll give birth to an Ishmael every time. When you try to take control of the promises of God, it'll it'll get outside of his purview. Genesis chapter 22, we're going to begin here in verse 1. The Bible says now Ishmael's already, he's, he's out of the house. Isaac is actually a grown man at this time as well. In Genesis chapter 22, it says sometime later, God tested Abraham. I know we don't like that, but God will test you. And God is testing Abraham. And it's going to be a big one. He says to Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, 
your only son, who you've been praying for, and you've been believing for, and finally he's here, and you love him so much. I can, I can see you love him so much. Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I'll show you. What did, what, what is God doing here? Listen, Abraham had fallen more in love with the promise of God than the God who gave the promise. He had been waiting for so long for this seed, this son, this heritage. So God gives a test. Give me the thing you love the most. The thing that was a dream come true when it happened. It might be hard for some of you to imagine a God that would ask Something like this, a child sacrifice, spoiler alert, it doesn't happen. He wasn't ever going to do it, okay? It never, it, it's not. It didn't happen. It wasn't meant to happen. This was a test. But you need to understand probably a couple things, two things about this test. Number one, this is profoundly prophetic. This test that God was giving Abraham was profoundly prophetic. This would mirror or foreshadow the ultimate sacrifice and provision of God through Jesus Christ, the very mountain that Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac on, just a couple hundred feet away is actually Mount Golgotha, where Jesus would carry the cross, the wood, like Isaac carried the burnt offering wood sacrifice on his back up that mountain. Jesus would go and be the lamb that was slain for the entire world. This is profoundly prophetic we see what God is doing through the narrative of history through Abraham and the covenant that he was making. But the second thing I think we need to understand about what this test is, is pagan sacrifices like this were very common in, in this day and age around Abraham in his life. In fact, Abraham came from a home that worshiped false god, demon gods, demons, and did demonic worship. Some of y'all didn't know that, huh? The demon, like he came from this. Let me show it to you in Joshua chapter 24, verse two. It said, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, who was the father of Abraham from Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River. Look what happened, look what happened. And they worshiped other gods. Well, who do you think those other gods are? Those are demons, you guys. They worship demonic spirits. Okay, so, so write this down. This story, this story was never about God trying to get Abraham to kill Isaac. This story was about God trying to get Abraham to kill idolatry within himself. That something got out of alignment and whack in his devotion, in his love for his son. We, we can end up loving the bless or more than the blessing. So many people come into houses of worship every week looking for a blessing, and they're not looking for the blesser. They're looking for provision, not the Lord our provider. This was never going to end with Isaac dying. This was going to end, and only could end, with idolatry dying in Abraham. What is idolatry, though? Let's kind of, here, here's what I want to do, because if, if you are going to know this God, Jehovah Jireh, you're gonna to have to understand what you're holding onto too tightly and what God wants to replace with his own provision, okay? So you're gonna to have to understand what idolatry is. What is idolatry? And then I'm gonna show you how God can reveal himself as Jehovah Jireh in your life through this story. First, what are idols? Idol, an idol is anything more important to you than God, to which many are like, well, nothing's more important to God. We're gonna test that, okay? We're gonna test that tonight. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination, more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. If we take Christianity out of it, an idol is anything that drives your life. It's the thing that motivates and compels you. Everyone has an idol. Everyone worships something. Let me say it this way. Everyone has an Isaac. It's important to understand that idols aren't just bad things, though. Idols can be good things taken into extreme. Like Abraham, who had this son who he loved. Idols control us, though, and, and, and we, they control us because we, we don't think we can live without them or don't want to live without them. And whatever controls us is the Lord of our life. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people that they want it to please. See, we don't control ourselves. That is a fallacy. You don't control yourself. Whatever is Lord in your life controls you. 
Amen, Pastor Jason. Y'all with me today? So, so what are the counterfeit gods that, that could be taking a place that Jehovah Jireh wants to fill? Okay, let me give you a few today because I, I think sometimes it's, it's hard to reveal, and I'm going to help you kind of peel back some onion layers to see if there are any counterfeit gods sitting on the throne of our heart. Here are a few that might be um, undetecting, undetected. Number one, write this down, happiness. Happiness can be a counterfeit God. I mean, everyone wants to be happy, but exactly what it means to be happy is different from every person. Everyone has different kind of idols based on their happiness. Ultimately, everyone wants to be happy, but how we define our happiness is how we're going to prioritize our life. Some people are workaholics because they, they want to feel better about their lives or they want to look better than other people. Some people spend hours at the gym, gym to look attractive or good looking or, or, or thin because being good looking gives them confidence and we idolize how we look or how other people think we look. Ultimately, these idols fall short of true happiness. Why? Because a workaholic can lose their job. Uh, the, the person who seeks to, to look attractive might gain some weight, and when they do, they're going to be devastated. Their self-worth is dependent on their idol, happiness. Write this one down. A counterfeit God is sex. Sex is a very prominent idol in our culture today. It's so discouraging and disheartening to, to read these stats that, that the sex industry, the porn industry, is a $1 trillion growing industry. Why is it so huge? Because people idolize Sex, it's a huge problem in our culture. Our culture promotes it. There's apps that exist for you to get it, like one night stands for it. But sex in and of itself is not evil. Sex is good within marriage, but sex is not God. And when you make sex God, you idolize it, it becomes the Lord of your life. Write this one down, and it might sound confusing, but another counterfeit God is love. How can love be Wait a second, it's natural for us to love others, but, but it can become idolatry. For example, I love my children so much. Abraham loved his son so much. But what happens when we idolize our children? We watch over them, we hover, we protect, we keep them from failing, we intervene, we guard them. We don't realize that we can, what we do for our children can actually ruin them. We're trying to love them but it's ruining them. They become dependent on us. And if they're experiencing never a failure as a child, then they're not gonna know what it feels like as an adult. This, this love can become idolatrous that we have for people in our life. Or how about money? Huge culture, idol in people's lives. Wanting money though, wanting to be successful, in and of itself, again, it's not an idol, but if you define your life by how much money you make, or if you prioritize money in your life above everything else, above your family, above your peace, above, your, above God, then, then you'll never be satisfied. How do you know if money is becoming your idol? Well, does your retirement account give you peace and comfort? Or how about this? If you lost it all, if you lost it all, is it hard to imagine life continuing? If everything gone, it might be an idol in your life. Or how about this? Success is another idol. The alcohol of our time is success. We live in this ultra competitive world and everyone's driving. Dri now look, again, success in and of itself, ambition in and of itself is not evil, but when we idolize success, when we pursue it, when it's what we dream about, meditate about, and imagine about, and think about, it's our goal in life to arrive at this place, it is an idol. And kind of akin to it is power. Write that down close cousin to success is power. We want to be in control of our own lives. We want to have power. We want to have influence. But in the end, power gives you this false sense of security. It's, it's fleeting. So how do we identify some idols? Let me give you a few more questions. Things become idols when they control our lives and when we become depressed and paralyzed in fear, thinking about even losing them. Let me give you four questions to identify some idols in your life. What occupies your mind? when you have nothing to think about. I call it the toilet seat imagination. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Too far. I'm sorry, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. We got nothing to think about. What do you habitually think about which gives you comfort, confidence, and strength? Where do you spend your time and money? What are you the most afraid of? See, if you're honest and you kind of can just examine your heart before God with these questions, it might reveal 
that there is a devotion and an attachment that you have to created things or abstract things that are other than God, taking the place of Jehovah Jireh in your life. See, idolatry didn't just exist in Abraham's day. It's still very alive today. It's alive in our own hearts, in our own minds. So God sees that his love, Abraham's love for Isaac, a child that has been promised, he's been praying for, he's been waiting for, for decades, his love for his son exceeds or even competes with his devotion and love to God. So here's the question today. It's the question that you and I need to wrestle with if we want to know Jehovah Jireh. And that is, what do you do when God asks you to sacrifice what you love? What do you do when God asks you to sacrifice the thing you love? Are you willing to trust God with your Isaac? The thing that matters most to you. The thing you're holding on so tight to, you don't want to let go. Everybody has an Isaac. Abraham, in this story, we see he does three things that lead to a revelation of Jehovah Jireh. And if you want to know this God in your life, if you want to know God, the Lord, our provider, then you're going to have to do the same thing. You're going to have to make these same choices that Abraham made. Because when God asks you to stop holding on to something, even if it's a good thing, it's not that he's asking you to get rid of some things and to throw them away. They could be good things, but they're out of order. God actually wants to bless you in their hands, not in yours. So what do we do? Three things, three choices that he made that we're going to have to make if we want to know Jehovah Jireh. The first is this, follow God. When God asks you to sacrifice what you love the most, follow God quickly. Quickly. God asked him to sacrifice his son, and a lot of us at that time would have had some questions. Hold on, hold on, wait a second. This don't make sense because this is the promise. This is what I've been waiting for. I don't get it, God. But some of us don't know this God, Jehovah Jireh, because God is still waiting on you to act on what he said before. Even though you may not understand it, like how it's gonna work out, I don't get it, God. See, a lot of what we're struggling with today, I think is simply delayed obedience. Imagine if a parent tells a child to do something and they say, I'll think about it. Come on, how many know there'd be some consequences for this kid? You know what I'm talking about? There better be some consequences for that kid. But here's what happens. God tells us to do something and we tell God, I'll think about it. And you do not have the authority to tell God that. It is no different than some child telling their parent, I'll think about it. When the creator of the universe tells you to do something, he expects you to do it now. Every parent knows that delayed obedience is disobedience. Psalm 119, verse 60 says, without delay, I hurry to obey your command. Man, I hurry to because I know on the other side of my obedience, there is a blessing. I know Jehovah Jireh is on the other side of my obedience. So when I hear a command of God, I hurry to execute, to obey, because I know God's going to meet me on the other end. That means you don't pause or question God's instructions. You obey first, and then you seek understanding later. In fact, you won't fully understand many of God's commands until you first obeyed them. In a lot of cases, it's your obedience that unlocks the understanding. Like you're not gonna know until on the other side of the mountain of sacrifice that God is asking you to make, it's not gonna make sense until you get on the other side and look back and say, oh, that's what you are doing, God. It's your obedience that will unlock the understanding. So what has God told you to do that you haven't done yet? What are you waiting for? Jehovah Jireh has something better for you if you would just trust him. That's what Abraham did. God says, sacrifice the son you love. And then it says in Genesis 22, early the next morning, he got up. No questions, no argument, no debating. Are you kidding me? And this is like, this is some faith right here because I'm I would have had some questions, man. This don't make sense, God. You got to explain some things to me. Burnt sacrifice, Isaac, are you, like, this doesn't make, but he gets up. Shad loads his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God told him about. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship and then he says, and we will come back to you, which I'm going to come back to you. But it's amazing even that, that he sees in faith that even though God's telling me to sacrifice my son, somehow God's going to do something because he's the son of the promise. We're going to go worship and we're both coming back together. 
So, so here's, if you want to know Jehovah Jireh, here, here's the example. God's telling you to let go of something, of something maybe you love or that's taking the place. If you want to know God as your provider instead of that thing you have as your provider or you think is your provider, you got to follow God quickly when he asks you, when he reveals himself. And then secondly, we have to follow God completely. I think a lot of us want partial credit from God. You know, I, but if Abraham only went halfway up the mountain, he would have missed the miracle. I mean, he would have said something like many of us probably say, Lord, at least give me credit for waking up. Lord, at least give me cre- credit for showing up. At least give me credit for getting dressed and saddling my donkeys, God. Psalm 119 and 4 says, Lord, you gave your orders to be obeyed, not just quickly, but completely. Partial obedience is still disobedience. You can't pick and choose which commands of God you want to follow. There's two important truths that you need to understand relating to God's commands. First, God's standard of right and wrong never changes. Okay, if something something was wrong 6,000 years ago, it's still wrong today. Culture changes, popular opinion changes, but truth never, ever changes. Truth is eternal. The second thing we need to understand is that God's perspective is bigger than yours. God sees what you can't see. You cannot see beginning and end, invisible, invisible. You cannot understand things seen and unseen that are going on around you, which means you need to trust God. James 4.11 says, your job is not to decide whether whether God's law is right or wrong, but to obey it. See, the oldest temptation is not murder and it's not lust. The oldest temptation is to doubt God's word. Satan is still playing the same trick he did on Eve when he told her in the garden, did God really say not to eat that? He convinced her that that her desires were more important than God's command. But faith is trusting God in the details and obeying him completely, not just the portion you understand, not just the portion you get, not just the portion you like. I know this is a hard one, but I want you to listen. I want you to know this Jehovah Jireh. And if so, if you want to know Jehovah Jireh, you got to follow God quickly and follow God completely. Genesis chapter 22 continues, verse 7. Isaac spoke up, poor Isaac, this dude. He said to his father, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, I see the firewood here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb? Every time we've been to worship God and we already had a sacrifice, I got this wood on my back, and I don't know, where's the, where's the sacrifice, God? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, it's important to note that he's a man already. He's a man, and Abraham's like 100 plus years old. There's no way that he's going to sacrifice Isaac without him as a willing sacrifice. Hebrews actually tells us in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament, gives us some insight as to why Abraham was even following through so quickly and so completely with God's command. It says this, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son in whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son, back from the dead. Abraham's son, he's, he said he's already promised him that he would be the heir and all generations would flow through him. So if he's telling me to sacrifice him, he must be resurrecting him from the dead. What faith Abraham had. It continues in Genesis 22 verse nine. When they reached the place that God had told them about, which is Mount Moriah, the top of the, which is where Jerusalem is built right now, where the temple was built, which is why Hamas and 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 these Palestinians, everyone is trying to get at this holy territory. They think it's theirs, and we say it's ours. It's been happening from the very beginning. Here Abraham gets to the top of this mountain. He builds an altar there and arranges the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know. And that stood out to me when I was reading this. God says, now I know that you fear God because you haven't withheld from me the thing that you love more than me, that you're holding on to tighter than me. Your only son. Now I know. And I thought to myself, doesn't God know everything? 
Doesn't he know everything? Isn't he like beginning and end? Isn't he infinite in knowledge? Yeah, yeah, he, he knows everything, but check this out. He hasn't experienced everything. What, what do I mean by that? So what, here's what God does. God wants us to know him personally. So he invites us to experience him in revelation, personally. He is an experiential God. He wants to show up. So, so God says, no, I already knew the decision you're going to make, but I hadn't experienced that decision yet, neither of you. So, so now I know. I mean, I already knew, but now I know the experience. I've experienced your faithfulness to me. So let me ask you a question. What does God know about you? What, what in your experience with God shows him that you will follow quickly, that you will follow completely, that you'll trust in Jehovah Jireh? This is why you have the challenge, why you have the crisis, why you have a drought. The very reason is so that you would experience the Lord, our provider. Follow God quickly. Follow God completely. And here's what he did. Number three, follow God willingly, willingly. So what I mean by that is he wasn't complaining all the way up the mountain. He wasn't like mad at God, stomping, uh, complaining to Isaac. Like when Isaac asked him, where is the offering? He didn't say, sucks to be you, because God's just like, it's, yeah, I don't want to give. I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. And God's not fair. And doesn't he see how hard this is for me? No, he didn't say that. He responded with faith. He said, God himself will provide the lamb. So, so here's what we need to see in this story. If you want to know Jehovah Jireh, we got to understand delayed obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience still. And resentful obedience is still disobedience. Abraham, look, Abraham didn't stop loving Isaac. He just decided to love God more than Isaac. That's what happened. Genesis 22 continues. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. This must have been the quietest caught ram ever to just like, all of a sudden, he sees like a ram caught. You think he'd be lashing around. He went over there, took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, this Jerusalem mountain where the temple is built, where Jesus was sacrificed just a couple hundred feet away on Mount Golgotha, on the mountain of the Lord, he prophesied, it will be provided once and for all. So listen, Isaac had to be placed on the altar, then and only then did the solution show up. God was not ready to reveal the solution, was not ready to reveal the ram until he obeyed and placed Isaac on the altar. He didn't know that as Abraham and Isaac were climbing up one side of the mountain, the solution was climbing up the other side of the mountain. He couldn't see the solution, but God had already had a ram coming up to get caught exactly where he needed to get caught. On the other side of what he could not see, his obedience, God's solution was making a way. Could it be that you've been waiting five years for something that God could give you in five minutes if he still wasn't, on, if he still wasn't waiting on you to place what he told you on the altar? Some of you single Christians, you, God's saying, give your singlehood to me. That may be your Isaac. Your desire for a mate is so strong that it's caused you to not follow God completely as a single person. And he could literally have a person waiting for you, sitting on the road next to you year after year, and you never see it because the thing he wants, you won't place on the altar. It could be money. God, I won't give the part I'm supposed to give to you until you give me more to make do, to which God's going to say you're going to be waiting a long time. God says, I want, you, I want to know that you trust me enough to go worship me, to go honor me, to climb that mountain, lay down your first fruits, not what you have left over. I want you to put it on the altar and the solution will be revealed. Maybe it's your career on the altar, whatever it is, your Isaac. I don't understand how it's going to work out, God. I don't know what you're going to do, God, but I'm going to trust you. You're going to have to supernaturally provide for this thing and fix it because I don't know what. See, you can't hold on to Isaac and get Jehovah Jireh. You can't. And that's our problem. I think we want our Isaac and we want Jehovah Jireh too. And God is saying, there's something that you need to let go of. You need to put on the altar if you want to know me this way, as the Lord, your provider. See, that word gyra, write this down. That word gyra actually means to see. All throughout the Bible, it's mostly translated as to see, as in God will see to it. 
No, no, he'll, he'll see to it. It's, it. it's translated see, inspect, perceive, provide, or to consider. See, God is inspecting the situation and he's providing the best solution for it. But he's waiting for you to lay it on the altar. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to, their, to what their deeds deserve. See, God is seeing how we respond. Are we gonna respond quickly, completely, and willingly? Because I'm telling you, he wants to be known by you as Jehovah Jireh. He wants to. He's inviting you into that. The problem is when God reveals himself to us, it's, it's most of the time in crisis and challenge. That's where he reveals. And it's in those times that we hold on to lesser gods. I can't let go. I don't understand how it's going to work. I don't understand how it's going to work. And God's saying, until you put it down, I'm not going to reveal the, the ram in the thicket that I already have prepared for you. Let me show you what, what the blessing is. That the provision of God is Jehovah Jireh in Genesis chapter 22. It's not in your notes, but in verse 15 through 18, it says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your Isaac, the thing you love the most, the thing that you can't, you, you've been dreaming for, you've been praying for, you've been, it could be, it could be your finances, it could be a, could be a relationship, it could be the thing you get security, comfort, or strength in, whatever that is, that because you have not withheld that, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. See, I'm not gonna take away, I'm not gonna take him away from you. I'm actually gonna bless him through you when you give him to me. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have because you obey quickly, completely, willingly. Maybe God is inviting you to know him deeper. And he wants you to have a personal revelation of who he is. But maybe some of you have delayed because you don't understand. And you don't get how that works or how it's going to work. Maybe some of you have just partially obeyed. You know, the parts you understand or that you're comfortable with or you're ready for. Or maybe you've, you've done it, but you've done it resentfully <laughs> with, with an attitude. What's your Isaac? What is God asking you to trust him with, to let go? If you want to know Jehovah Jireh, you got to follow God quickly, completely, and willingly. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.